We've been taught almost uh, from a health and, and wellness perspective to give our body and responsibility to somebody else, uh, meaning sort of going to the doctor and say, this is what's wrong with me. What do I need to do to fix me? Or go to a physiotherapist and saying, this is what's wrong with me. Fix me. And there is a lot of stuff that we can do for ourselves if we just bring ourselves back to the fundamental basics. And it is all generally because we just don't move the right way. And we have not been doing that for a very, very long time. Hi, my name is Dr. Rongan Chatterjee, medical doctor, author of The Four Pillar Plan and television presenter. I believe that all of us have the ability to feel better than we currently do, but getting healthy has become far too complicated. With this podcast, I aim to simplify it. I'm going to be having conversations with some of the most interesting and exciting people both within as well as outside the health space to hopefully inspire you as well as empower you with simple tips that you can put into practice immediately to transform the way that you feel. I believe that when we are healthier, we are happier because when we feel better, we live more. Hello and welcome to episode 43 of my Feel Better, Live More podcast. My name is Rongan Chastji and I am your host. Before we get on to today's episode, just to let you know that low energy is one of the commonest complaints I see in my practice. And for that reason, I have created a free six-part video series to help you increase your energy so that you can get more out of life. You can sign up for free at drchatterjee.com forward slash energy. Now, today's episode is all about behavior change and how we create long-term healthy habits. My guest today is David Higgins, someone who has been a personal trainer for many years, but recently has become known as Trainer to the Stars, training all kinds of celebrities such as Samuel L. Jackson, Claudia Schiffer, Colin Firth, and Naomi Campbell. We discussed if there is actually any difference between training a Hollywood superstar and training a regular member of the public. David shares what he considers to be the three key factors in making any long-term lifestyle change, the problems of exercising incorrectly, as well as the importance of breathing. I chose this episode to kick off 2019, as I know many of you will be using the new year as a way of kickstarting lifestyle change. I hope you find it useful. Now, before we get started onto today's conversation, I do need to give a very quick shout out to our sponsors who are essential in order for me to be able to put out weekly podcast episodes like this one. Athletic Greens continue their support of my podcast. Now, I prefer that people get all of their nutrition from their foods, but for some of us, this is not always possible. Athletic Greens is one of the most nutrient-dense whole food supplements that I've come across and contains vitamins, minerals, prebiotics, and digestive enzymes. If you are looking to take something each morning as an insurance policy to make sure that you are meeting your nutritional needs, I can highly recommend it. For listeners of this podcast, if you go to athleticgreens.com forward slash live more, you will be able to access a special offer where you get a free travel pack box containing 20 servings of Athletic Greens, which is worth around £70 with your first order. You can check it out at athleticgreens.com forward slash live more. Now, on to today's conversation. So David, welcome to the Feel Better Live More podcast. Thank you very much for having me. So David, you have got a brand new book out called The Hollywood Body Plan, and you are known as Personal Trainer to the Stars. As my eyes roll, but thank you very much. That's very kind. You're, yes. You're, yeah, just, just coming, your eyes did roll there. And I'm sorry <laughs> to start off with that. But, you know, you have um, trained people like, you know, Samuel L. Jackson, Claudia Schiffer, Colin Firth, you know, all kinds of celebrities who many of us are very familiar with. But I guess I'm really intrigued as to what can I and Joe Public learn from what you have learned from training some of these you know, world famous celebrities? Well, the funny thing is I've only been doing only, I say only, I've only been doing film uh, for about five years. My previous career was actually working 
uh, in and around the London scene, um, own gyms and working with tens of thousands of, of clients over the last or previously 10 years. So it's actually what I've learned from everybody else uh, and then implementing that into the film industry itself is probably more of, of what and how I do things. And, and uh, it's ironic, but everybody is the same. Everybody has the same issues. Everybody has the same hangups. Everyone knows that they probably should work out more, knows that they pro- probably should eat more, uh, eat better. Um, and, and the only difference is uh, that the support around a film production that is regarding Sam, Mr. Samuel Jackson or Margot Robbie or Claudia Schiffer um, is that they have absolute access to the best people in the world to give them guidance. But at the end of the day, it's up to them to take themselves through the program um, and get up in the morning and attend and be there and be present and make the right food choices. So yes, they have the support, but realistically um, it's still up to them whether or not they want to go out drinking and eating and having a great time at nighttime and and then burning the candle at both ends or being relatively, uh, healthy and, and practical about it and go, no, I know that I have to be sharp for my life and to be the, uh, the person that I want to be going forward. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting for us to hear, isn't it? That ultimately with all, all the support, with all the money in the world, you, no one can do the work for you. you. You know, maybe things, maybe systems can be put in place to make things a little bit easier potentially, but you're still the one who's got to go and eat the right food, do the workout that. You know, needs maybe, to be done. It needs to be done. Yeah, exactly. So, if you're saying that everyone has the same hang-ups and obstacles to improving their lifestyle, you know, what are those hang-ups and obstacles? Consistency is is one. Um, I think that once somebody makes a a plan and then they they if they stick to it, then it's very, very hard to sort of go off the rails a little bit one way or the other. So consistency, I find, if you, is, is one of the most important things. That if, you, if you lay out a plan and you stick to it, then you're going to be relatively okay. Um, making it a priority as well um, because everybody can push things that aren't necessarily so important in their lives, you know, to the side and take the easier option. So making it a priority, that's really important as well. Um, Oddly, but celebrating success. So I always, in the Hollywood Body Plan book, I have an assessment at the beginning and we go, okay, this is where you are and you take note of where you are. And it's a movement-based assessment uh, based around range of movements of upper back, lower back, any pain, discomfort, anything like that. So you can, it's a very simple easy to operate, do it yourself, assess yourself uh, program. And you go, you can get a score at the end of it and go, okay, fine. This is where I am. And after the first 21 days, you can take that assessment again and go, oh, look, I've improved in X, Y, and Z. My core strength, my flexibility, my posture as a general. Um, and then once they go through the transformational program again, which is another sort of uh, 13 weeks over that, you can really see the difference. So celebrating the success and establishing where you've come from is really, really important. Is that celebrating success over 12 or 13 weeks or is it literally a daily celebration of success when you actually do your workout, let's say? The, the workout itself or the food that you've eaten or just the day that you've had, I think I'm, I'm a big fan of celebrating a bit of everything. You know, um, make it... Make it through that week, fine. Make it through the first 21 days, fine. Done it, tick that box and acknowledge what you have achieved because I think that people are a little bit, they, they just, they don't, uh, they don't celebrate as much as they should. They don't allow themselves to go, oh, I've achieved something. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been reading a lot about behavioral science recently in terms of, you know, what is it that makes somebody stick to a behavior? And quite often it comes up that reward mechanism that's, you know, for example, you know, if you eat sugar and you, you have something deliciously sweet, you feel good, right? So there's an association that every time I do that, I feel good. So that's almost programming you to do it again because you know that there's an immediate feeling of reward that you get. Yeah. 
Whereas sometimes that isn't there for a lifestyle choice. Sometimes, sometimes it's like, well, I'm going to do this and it's going to help me in 10 years time or 15 <laughs> years time. And a lot of these behavioral science guys are, do, do talk about rewarding yourself in some way every time you make a positive, yeah. um, positive change. So in this book, I have gone back to basics, um, first principles, you know, how to breathe. I think that we really have forgotten living this sedentary lifestyle that we, that we all occupy these days. What my goal is to, is to, I suppose, disrupt this chronic stillness that I find we, we are in. Um, what do you mean by that? I know it's, it's a really interesting sort of one liner, isn't it? Well, I, I really feel that we have been so disconnected from our bodies uh, through, obviously, through technologies. Um, we have learned to exercise outside of ourselves, just do what it is that the guy in the front of the class is doing, and then that will be good for me in the long run. You know, we have started to, um, we have started to, I suppose, give our we've been taught almost uh, from a health and and wellness perspective to. It, to to give our body uh, and and responsibility to somebody else, uh, meaning sort of going to the doctor and say, this is what's wrong with me, what do I need to do to fix me? Or go to a physiotherapist and saying, this is what's wrong with me, fix me. And there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of stuff that we can do for ourselves if we just bring ourselves back to the fundamental basics. And it is all generally because we just don't move the right way and we have not been doing that for a very, very long time. I mean, that's something that really struck me when, when I when I read through your book is you you said something along the lines of I'm going to help you to move more, but also move better. And I think that's very interesting because um, you know it's not uncommon to go into a gym now and see someone, let's say, with poor posture who is potentially accentuating and, and exacerbating. exacerbating their problem with their posture, with the exercises they're choosing to do, because they're the standard exercises that everybody does. Is that what you're getting at when you say move better? Yes, as well as not only just move better, but I'm trying to bring an understanding is into people of how they are currently moving, understand what they're doing sort of not as well as they probably should, the compensatory movements that they are adapting and adopting for however long. And now bring that into this is how you are supposed to move. Um, so going back to the the first principles in the book, it's 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 how to breathe. You know, we forget that our neck, our shoulders, and our chest should be doing roughly I don't know fifteen twenty percent of the of the inhale maximum. Um, that's if we're taking a really deep breath in, uh, rather than our abdominal doing eighty percent of it. And unfortunately, it's the other way around these days because we sit down all day, we shrug, we hunch forward we get our neck involved in everything and it's just easier for that period of time to get the neck to do the breath um so bringing it back to those first principles of breathing and, and get the diaphragm actually doing what it's supposed to is, is really important i mean i was struck by that very early on in the book i think maybe right at the start you talk about breathing and that surprised me because um i i also agree that breathing is very very important um there's to, a chat to live to live, yeah. Yeah, so we can, clearly we can all breathe. Yeah. But can we breathe the right way, the yeah. most efficient way? And uh, in, in my book, The Stress Solution, I did a whole chapter on, on breathing and about how important it is yeah. and how breathing correctly, efficiently, in the right proportions, using, you know, using your diaphragm mostly and also using your ribs a little bit and your neck and yeah. all those things can help to lower your stress levels immediately. So immediately, yep. So it's interesting for me that I'm guessing now that people come to you, whether it's your celebrity clients or you know your Joe Public regular clients, wanting to improve their physique and get fitter, let's say. Do you talk to all of them about breathing? Yeah. You have to pepper it in a little bit. Yeah. You can't just bang on for an hour about, now this is how you breathe. Because, oh God, you know, they'll be walking out the door in two seconds. So you've got to be, you know, you, you've got to... Be a little gentle with it, and also, but with regards as a good trainer, a good trainer is somebody who gives the client what they want, but also almost tricks them into the training what they need, sure, as well. Um, and I suppose if people start coming to you and you get a little bit more of a reputation, and 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 
they come to you for reasons to fix them, so fix them from issues that they have having because of lifestyle, because of whatever and however they've, they've, they've gotten injured or whatever it is, um, then you have a little bit more room to move to go, no, this is the process. This is how we do things. And, and I do with whomever I train with, whoever I work with, whether it's on the film or in my gyms, um, it's the same process. I will always give them the first fundamental 21-day reset program that is, that is in the Hollywood Body Plan because it brings everybody up to speed and it gets them consciously moving in the right way and they are aware that, oh, so how I hold myself during the day impacts how I feel. And that is, it's not just, I'm just going to go to the gym for an hour and, and tick that box. You go to the gym for the cherry on the top. It's the 23 hours during the day that, well, apart from sleeping, obviously, but it's the, it's the other hours of the day that are really going to make that, that shift. I mean, David, I think that's a very important message, isn't it? We've, you know, we've outsourced so much of our health to other people and to other things. So the gym, for example, you know, people are constantly trying to motivate themselves to work out and get to the gym, let's say, if that's their chosen place to work out. Yep. And I see this with my patients all the time. If they have gone to the gym, that is a big enough achievement in itself. That's a big tick. It doesn't matter what you did at the gym. Were you exacerbating your postural problems? Was it the most efficient workout for you in the context of the rest of your lifestyle? Hey, the fact that you went to the gym was a tick. And of course, I recognize that, you know, for, for someone who's trying to get active, yep. that is a great start. Um, but, but that's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, what is, the, what is the right form of exercise and movement for you? So what, well, we'll go into this 21-day this program that you put everyone on, but I'd love to understand a bit about your journey. I mean, you're, we're sitting here in London, in Camden Town at the moment, having this conversation, but you were born in Australia, right? Yeah, born and bred in Australia, in Melbourne. So how do you get from Melbourne to London? Um, I used to play Australian rules football uh, at a very competitive level and at about 19, and at the same time I was studying uh, my exercise rehab degree. And I got injured playing football and I dislocated my shoulder and I tore my ribs from my sternum. And it was, it was a f interesting time as a 19 year old. <laughs> um, and luckily because I was earning, uh, I was, I was learning how to ex what exercise rehab was at university. I then had to work out how I can rehab myself. Um, and trust me going through that process, I understand pain. You know, I understand what what discomfort and pain and agony really does feel like and also to overcome it and then what you have to do to overcome it. Um, and so I, I put my, uh, my learnings, I suppose, into practice. And over a year or so, I got, without having to have surgery, I got into back to full range of movement and, um, and back playing again. But And is that... Is that did that exceed what your doctors and team had said at that time? Was it, was it, was that? I mean, at the time uh, it was always about, you need to go into surgery. And for me, surgery is the last resort. If I, it, it, you know, if you I, need it, you'll if take I it. needed it, I, I'll, I'll do it. But I knew that I will do my absolute best not to do that. Um, so for me, it was, it was, it was, the, it was a one way trip to make sure that I was, you know, able to do what I needed to do. I guess that, that leads to the question, you know, you're presumably a big part of what you do is help people engage in behavior change. And you, like many of us, myself included, had adversity that almost persuaded you that you had to look at things a slightly different way and figure out, you know, what you need to do in your own life to get healthy again. In your experience as a trainer, you know, and this applies to everyone, do you feel that we all need a certain level of, advers of adversity sometimes to motivate that behavior change? Unfortunately, unfortunately, yes. Yeah. It is, I've been racking my brains for the last however long going, what is going to help people and how can I convince them to help themselves? And the only way that people get there is to get there by themselves on their own 
and they may or may not be very, very close to a very, very scary proposition, an alternative of you're going to you're fork in a road. You're either going to go turn right and keep on going down this road and who knows what's going to happen, or you're going to turn left and you're going to fix yourself, help yourself, and live a happier, healthier, pain-free life. And I have the, um, the hope that that is exactly what um, you know, this book is going to help people to do, but also to hopefully give some, some guidance and support along that way as well, which is what, where I get the kick out of, by the way. I love helping people overcome this adversity, overcome this this fear, this this constant wake up in the morning, oh my back, or you yeah. know, I can't play with my kids because of X or Y or shoulder or knee or hip or whatever it is. Um, and to get them through that process, that's what gets me up in the morning. Yeah. No, I I, I very much resonate with that because um you know, one of the things I love about my job as a as a doctor, as a GP, is how can you connect with that person in front of you and inspire them to make change. Because I don't think that, you know, I don't think knowledge is enough for everyone. You know, I think most people now in society know that, you know, they should probably be moving more than they currently do. Um, but knowledge doesn't necessarily lead to change. To change. No. Um, and the one thing I really liked in, in your book is you, you put towards the start, I think, you know, you've got to figure out why do you want to do this? What is your motivation for doing that? And can you tell me a little bit about that? Why do you think that's so important that someone understands their motivation? I think that if somebody is going to, if a client comes to me or if they read this book and they go, yeah, you know what? I want to, I want to have six pack and look like an absolute Adonis on the beach and I'm going to pick up the Hollywood body plan. Um, now that person will absolutely get some really interesting fundamentals out of this book and then hopefully change their perspective on things. But that person is purely driven through aesthetics. Um, and unfortunately, that's not going to give you the motiva enough motivation to get you past that three-week, four-week, five-week process in, in, in trying to change your lifestyle. What will give you that motivation to change the way that you live, the way that you move, the way that you eat, your lifestyle as a general is a real reason why. And the real reason why is to not just overcome pain, but to live a happier, healthier, longer life so that you can be as active, as switched on, as sharp at work as you possibly can be, to be that person who you want to be. Now, that is a serious goal. That is a fantastic reason as to why you want to change, not to lose weight in two weeks. Yeah. Um, and so that's my entire philosophy. We are looking for long-term change. Yeah, I mean, I love it. That's why this podcast is called Feel Better, Live More, because <laughs> it's not... It's not just about, oh, it's important to make lifestyle change because it will help me lose weight. Of course, that of course may be the goal will. for someone. Of course. But it's more about that when you feel the best that you can be, I think you get more out of life. You get more out of your relationships, more out of your work, more out of your free time, more mm. out of your holidays, more out of everything when you feel as good as you, you can. And there was a bit in your book that, you know, in I think page six, the quote, it, it was brilliant. Um the human body is amazing. Just think of everything it can do. It will support you and sustain you if you take care of it. That's why we should treat it like a temple. Instead, most of us vandalize our bodies. We don't carry out maintenance early enough. Instead, allowing damage to build up by failing to correct postural problems when they first appear. I think that was incredible. It really sums a lot of things up there. And you talk about posture, and I think that's. It's really important because, A, with poor posture, if you do the wrong movements, you can access, you can, you can, you uh, will, not just can, you will. Yeah, you, you will make that posture worse. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's as if we don't, we wait for pain before we start addressing things. It's like, hey, you know, yes, I'm a bit hunched over, but I'm not in pain, so I can keep going. But at some point, that will come and bite you on your bum, won't it? Well, pain is subjective first. So uh, what somebody, you know, somebody could 
get roll an ankle and and still ride a skateboard and go ah it'll be fine versus somebody rolling an ankle and be you know saddled up saddled up in their bed for however many so pain firstly is is definitely subjective um and that's a big thing because if you if you are worried about I just don't want to hurt myself even more. If you're in that mindset of, I just don't want to do anything or, or, or upset the apple cart because I might exaggerate it a little bit more, then unfortunately, you're on that negative spiral because if you don't do something that you know that you probably should be doing, or if you, your body will build up its these mechanisms, these guards, these, these different movement programs that will shift the focus, probably unconsciously. So, you know, sometimes you might not even realize it, you know, my back's a bit dodgy. I'm going to use the armchair. So I'm going to twist and push my hand down, use the arm, armchair and lift up that way um, as opposed to just standing up straight and using your abdominals to do with the job. Uh, that, those kinds of movements, they really do uh, add up over periods of time to until one day you're, you bend down and you pick up the shopping bag but put it away in the shop. And your back goes, and you, and and like Dave, I don't. They come to me like Dave, I don't know what happened. All I did was just pick down, go down, and mm. pick up the shopping. My back did. I said, well, it's unfortunately, it's not the shopping bag that did it. It's the ten years previous yeah. that you ignored, however for however long, and now you're at a place where you're in pain, you're in discomfort, and the quick fix that we could have probably solved your issue back then, unfortunately, is sort of out the window a little bit now. And so we need to make sure we, we change the way that you move, changing and adapting the way that you move, firstly, recognizing how you're moving and then changing it from there. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And so many of us, we need that, that tragedy to happen, whether yeah. it's with our body or our back pain or our, you know, a sudden acute bit of back pain where you suddenly can't do the things that you used to do. I think I've said it, I think before many times that most of us take our backs for granted until something happens. And then we realize, oh, we use our backs for pretty much everything, everything. that we do. <laughs> I know in me in my twenties, when I had really bad back problems, uh, that was very much the case. And, you know, when I had those back problems, I would avoid movements that exacerbated them or put a strain on them. But I realized that I would do that year in, year out. And before you knew it, I was just avoiding certain movements. Mm. And it's only since I properly got to the root cause and rehabilitated my back. Or was it your feet? It was my feet. It was. It was my feet. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> it was my feet. It's always, it, it's, it's most of the time starts that's from That's incredible. There. Yeah. I've, I've done a podcast with someone called Gary Ward a few episodes ago in the podcast. And um, <laughs> he was the guy who... Arch collapsed. Yeah. 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 My right foot uh, was stuck in pronation. Yeah. So it was very flat. Yeah. And Gary gave me a series of exercises mm. to do. And, you know, five years on, well, longer than five years on now, I've got an arch in my right foot yeah. without an insole. Right. There it because is. Because I've started using my feet properly. Yeah. I do exercises on them. And it's just incredible. That was never actually a back problem. It was my back was taking the strain. Yeah for other problems in my in my biomechanical yeah. system. Yeah. And it's only when I started training, yes, the foot, but also as part of a whole body movement, yes. that now I do everything that I used to avoid, I can now do with no problems. I'm not even- It's one, confidence as well. It's confidence. I'm not even 1% worried that my back's going to go. Yeah. I know- You're fine. My back is bulletproof now. Yeah. And some people say, no, wrong, be careful. You had, you had all these problems. I don't need to be careful because no. I know I fixed it. Yeah. And- but equally, if you don't keep on top of it, yeah, it's not. It's not like a. a, a you have to be mindful of it the whole time because if you're naturally that way inclined, you know, you know, what, I could. As long as I keep on top of it, it's like my shoulder. It's exactly the same thing. I know that if I don't constantly keep my shoulder in good position, like writing this book, my God, <laughs> I tell you what, talking about being hunched over in front of a computer tell me for about hours. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, like just having to reset that whole thing. You really have to be aware. And I've never, luckily from my perspective, my job is, is, is to help people and, and, and not be at the desk all day. So to, to sit down and really write for hours on end, for, for months on end, I really, I really sort of felt what people feel. Why, why did you write the book, can I ask? Um, because I wanted to, I felt that I could help 
a larger amount of people um, understand and hopefully just gain a little bit more knowledge and, and, and hopefully try to dispel some myths possibly that it's, it's, it's the, the only way are uh, drugs and surgery um, yeah. and, and to, to promote health and wellness the best way that I could possibly know how to. Yeah, it's a, it's a great writing book. It's a great medium to impact a, a lot it's of people. It's very cathartic. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know how you found it, but what I found is that a lot of things that I used to do intuitively with patients. Yeah, um, trying uh, to articulate that. Exactly. Like, oh. It's how do you, oh. how do you actually structure that? Yeah. And, you know, you almost have to order your thoughts and write in the book, then you almost know the material better than beforehand because yep. you've actually had to structure it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, the same I, feel, thing. I feel it's made me a better practitioner of what I do yep. by writing the book because totally. now I think I've, I've just more ordered and, and you're sort of nodding your head. I totally agree. Totally, 100% agree. And a lot of what I say to my clients um, and my general principles about things, I had to, before I wrote it, and I'm like, actually, is this still right? Because what we, <laughs> what we learned at university and what we continue to learn, you know, what they say over there is uh, when I was, the uh, professor told me once, he said, okay, guys, 50% of what, you, what we are teaching you is right. 50% of it is wrong. We just don't know which 50% is, is going to be. And, and, and we're like, what were you talking about? And as a kid at university, you don't know what that means. Yeah. But as you go through this, this journey in this industry um, and you get the experience, which is everything, obviously, and working with bodies and people and, and how to convince them, in a, influence probably is a better word, influence them to make the right choices and help them that way. Uh, before writing it down, I had to just, just double check that everything that I was saying is still, still relevant. Still relevant. Um, and 80% of it was, 20% of it wasn't. And the other 20% was like, oh, okay, that's an interesting perspective. I didn't really think about it like that. Um, and that has also really leveled me up as a, as, a, as a trainer as well, working in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it fascinates to hear your insights from writing your book. Um, the, the, so this 21-day program, okay, that you put everyone on, whether yep. you're Claudia Schiffer yep. or you're... Margot Robbie, Samuel... Who else is on the title here? Let's just see. Sam, Samuel Jackson. Rebecca, Fer Rebecca Ferguson um, from Mission Impossible. Uh, yeah, no, I've been... All those good. guys, but Colin also, Perth, yeah. but also, you know, the guy next door, yep. right, who's looking for help with their physique and their fitness. So can you walk through some of the principles in it? What do you do? Is correcting postural imbalances part of that? And Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, how I work is that usually I, how it works rather, is that you, if you are effectively working on one area of the body, you know you need to be working on everything of the body. Like you said, your back sore, it's because your ankle foot collapsed. Um, just because you work on one thing, it doesn't mean it affects anything else and vice versa so what i've done from the approach of breaking it down is that you teach in isolation at the beginning and generally from a movement perspective isolation, do you mean body parts in isolation body parts in isolation so you activate so we sit down on our butts all day uh which means that unfortunately our glutes which are the major stabilizers of our bodies uh tend to sort of shut off a little bit and not work as well, which puts strain on and pressure on our lower back and our hamstrings take more of the work or our hips and hip flexors do it. So we have to establish glute activation as a primary. Uh, we have to establish better core activation, uh, control your breath through that engagement, and then you can interconnect those two uh, fundamental pieces of the body and then you can promote active movement from there so you work from isolation into integration of general movements so people are starting quite small are they in terms yeah. of little movements just trying to retrain the body retrain, the right movements connect your brain to your muscle yeah and once you've got that then you can move on then to, you can move and, and are these movements that um people need to join a gym for or they can do no, in the comfort it's, of their it's own all home? based at home and it is i've stripped away as many obstacles as as, as possible so people can it, it is a handful of there's a there's a foam roller in there, my beloved foam <laughs> roller. Um 
that there is a, a couple of sort of mini therabands and, and exercise bands, but it's all very, very easy to, to manage and, and very hopefully cheap to, to buy anyway. So very accessible for most people. Totally. Um, and, and how, is it something they have to do every day or is it something that they can... First 21 days, every day. Every day. Okay. And how long per day? It's about roughly 21 minutes for the exercise program every day. And as you build up that 21 minutes, um, it will, for the first couple of days until you get into the flow of it, it might be 25 minutes or so just to sort of understand what it yeah. is you're doing. But every week the, for the first 21 days, so seven days, you start on a Monday, finish on a Sunday, then you go to the second workout, start on a Monday, finish on a Sunday, third workout. So you've gone through three weeks of 21 days and you're establishing your baseline level of just movement structure, practice, and engagement. From that, it is also, there is also, if you wanted to, there is also an intermittent fasting program that runs concurrently with that 21-day fasting period. So if you were down the road of, you know what, I want to lose weight, I want to be healthier, I want to move more, but I want to also correct myself posturally before I go and jump around wherever it is I want to do, the movement that I want to do, um, then this is the book definitely for you it gets your absolute fundamental movements down and you are going oh okay i didn't realize i did that oh that's a bit sore that's i can't feel that engagement why can't i so that's interesting isn't it is it starting to connect to what your body's doing you said we become disconnected from our bodies in some ways it sounds like your first 21 days are reconnecting are reconnecting and bringing that back yeah it's called um, a re we call it the reset the reset 21 day reset um and then from the 21-day reset program, then you can go on to that 13-week transformational program. Yeah. What, one of the things I, I noted down when I was reading your book is um, you spoke about Pilates and you said that Pilates was great for you, but not perfect. So you pulled apart its philosophy and tweaked it. Mm. And I really resonated with that, actually, because I thought, is that something we all need to do to a certain degree? Instead of outsourcing it um, to somebody else, yes, we need somebody else maybe to teach us some principles, but then we need to understand what works for us and what's not working so well for us. Is that is that something that many of us can learn from, do you think? I hope so. I mean, just because there is a practice out there, whether it's Pilates, whether it's yoga, whether it's whatever it is out there, these principles, if taught correctly, um, are just a guideline. They're a guideline and they are hopefully, once you've mastered them, then you can, it gives you that, that ability. It's a bit like learning to drive a car for the first time. And you can, you, you, you know where your hands are, 10 on the two on the steering wheel, you adjust the mirrors, you put your seatbelt on, da, 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 da. And then once you've passed, hopefully, uh, then you can start to put a little bit of flair into it. And that's, that's, that's effectively what is most important about this book is that you understand the, the fundamental principles of how you should move and uh, then you can add on top yeah. of that yourself. Well, I guess what, what a common um, mistake I think that people make, well, maybe it's not a mistake, uh, a common occurrence is that let's say in January, which is the typical time of the year for this, um, where... People want to get fit, right? And they think, okay, right, this is the year. I'm going to go and do, get properly fit and do my workout program. Oh, I like this thing that I've just read in a magazine. I'm going to go and do that. I'm going to do loads of box jumps and whatever other high intensity type movement they want to do. Mm. Whilst I think that has benefit, um, do you see a big problem sometimes when people are doing that? They they haven't done the basics. They've got hunched over bodies. They've got glutes that don't fire appropriately. And then they're going off trying to put a load of weight onto a structure. And already out of yeah. position structure. Yeah, it's not problematic. Totally. I mean, imagine uh, you, you, you sit down all day. I use this analogy or this story. You sit down all day at the office or, or wherever in the car uh, and you will naturally fall out of position. So your body gets used to whatever position it gets put into. So it adapts, right? It adapts. It adapts positively or negatively. And you get these, and I call them chair shaped bodies, um, walking into a gym to do the right thing, to do a good thing for themselves, to 
feel better about themselves, to whatever it is, to get a good sweat on. And that's all fantastic, amazing. However, you have to understand that if you load an already overloaded system, so you, you if you want to bench or if you want to squat or whatever, you are using those same muscles that have been holding you up in that seated position rather than going, actually, you know what? I need to reset, understand that my lifestyle is X. I know that I need to probably do something before I'm going to lift that weight. And to get the most out of that workout, that's where this Hollywood Body Plan program comes in. And it is just that basic fundamentals of resetting what you've been doing to yourself for 10 years, 15 years, however long you've been doing it for. And it is, the body is so, it is such an amazing thing that it adapts, like I said, positively, if you just give it a little bit of love. And that's what this is really yeah. all about. I guess 21 days of doing, what, 21 minutes a day. I mean. Um, or let's call it 20, 25, something like that, <laughs> right? So let's say, what's that, seven days of... You know, that's like 104, let's call it 150 minutes. And you implement what you're learning and doing in those 21 days throughout, throughout the, the rest day. of the day. But that's actually over three weeks, that's let's say 450 minutes that you are actually putting your body first saying, hey, I'm giving you 450 minutes of love over this three weeks, which actually 450 minutes is, well, it sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But it's only 20, you know, it's not far as 20 minutes, minutes a day. day. Um, no excuses, by the way. No excuses. no excuses. Okay. So what would you say then to somebody who's listening to this who goes, look, I just want to get fit. I want to get cracking. Um, I don't have time for 21 minutes a day. Yes, you do. Do it when you're watching TV. Do it when, uh, split it up 10 minutes in the morning and night. You have time. Um, Listen, I, I, I totally understand. I've got a young family. I am up early, early, early with the kids. I am obviously back home late after work. There is very limited time to do anything more than I can possibly do. But if you don't make this a priority and if you, don't, if you actually want to make lasting and long change, you have to change something. And that is to implement this little nugget gold mine of information that will hopefully grow and grow and grow so that you can help yourself long term to become that person that you want to be. Yeah, very powerful, David. And um, you know, we know that our lean muscle mass is one of the strong one of the biggest predictors of how well we're going to be as we age. But I think mobility is so important as well because Yes, we're all living longer now, but what are we going to be able to do in those final years, in the last decade, in the last two decades? Are we still going to be able to, you know, carry shopping up two or three flights of stairs? Are we going to be able to pick things up from the floor, play with our children or grandchildren? grandchildren? Yeah. And I think that piece gets missed a lot, which is why I'm so delighted to have seen that in your book, is that whole mobility piece, the whole posture correction piece. It's not just about working out more it's about working out better smarter and uh, yeah and smarter and of course some people choose to do that with you but what you've tried to do is say well hey i've been doing this for a long time and it doesn't matter who i'm training whether they're some of the most famous people in the world or some people that we've never heard of actually the problems are still the same yeah and that i think is a very empowering message actually um the other thing that I thought was very new about what I saw was that you talk about some of the exercises. I think I think this is after the 21-day plan, but you do some exercises which also uh, incorporate stimulation of the central nervous system. <laughs> yeah. um, can you explain that? Of course. Um, so there is a whole chapter dedicated to stimulating the central nervous system in a positive way. So recalibrating uh myofascia and fascia is what's the best way to explain it it has an effect uh it affects everything and it can and if you can stimulate for example if you can release the fascia in the bottom of your feet by 
rolling a little golf ball underneath it for 30 seconds, you can lengthen your hamstring flexibility and decrease the load on your lower back. So what it is, it's a whole chain of, I explain it like cling film. Cling film that's wrapped around, and this isn't a woo-woo thing, this is actually scientific Absolutely. proven, <laughs> that it is attached to every ligament, every organ, every muscle, every chain of muscular systems within the body, goes from the bottom of our feet up to our eyebrows. Okay, what do you think lifts our eyebrows? That's, you know attached to at the bottom of your feet and if you roll and release the fascia at the bottom of your feet sometimes you'll see and find that people their headaches start to dissipate and go yeah. away um and so what this whole chapter is it's a very cool chapter that i'm very very proud of um that i will teach you some quick fixes how to disrupt and dis in a positive way the how your body is holding its tension and the muscular system underneath that fascia chain to release and relax. So it's all about uh, increasing your mobility. I'm trying to hack that central nervous system and give you the ability to go, oh, okay, my lower back sore. So what do I have to do to release it? And I'll give you these little mechanisms. Or oh, my neck is really sore. Oh, I've been hunched over all day in the office. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to self-massage and self-correct. And it just is very, very powerful stuff. Yeah. And it, it's great that you're giving people these tools to do without the need to necessarily see you. They can apply these tools at home. And, you know, this, these, there must be a lot of hacks here that you have picked up yeah. over the years from dealing with hundreds, thousands of people and helping them improve their lives. You're able to give some of the best bits of that yeah. for people, which, which is fantastic. Running. I want to talk about running. Okay. Because I've had a few guests on the podcast who have talked about how running has changed their lives. You know, they've they they just find it incredible. You know, I spoke to someone called Vassos Alexander, um, William Pullen. They've they've got some really profound stories about how running improved mental health, the way they feel. It's had positive impacts onto many other aspects of their lives. And those podcasts always do really well. People like them, but there's always a few people who will comment saying, look, that's great and brilliant for him, but I can't run or I need to be careful about running because I've been told it's going to affect my joints as I get older. And you talk a little bit about this in the book, don't you, about running? Mm -hmm. I mean, I personally am a runner. I love, and I have been forever. Um, but if I, <laughs> these days, uh, it's sad to say, but I feel like I have to warm up longer than I even must run, the, you know, these days. But I am on the foam roller for a good 20 minutes before I go for a run. And I go for either a 5 or a 10K, um, come back, and then I'm on it again for a good 10 minutes post. Um, and that little routine is all in the book. Uh, but what that helps me do, do is just helps me helps my body recover and 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 be able to run because it clears my head i, I love it um and what i find very difficult i suppose sometimes is when people have gone to a practitioner within the industry at whatever level and they say you can't do don't do x don't do y you can't run you can't whatever it is, squat, lunge, whatever. So, you, I'm like, so then they come to me and they go, I can't do this because they told me that I can't. I'm like, okay, so you can't squat. Okay, fine. So what do you do? How do you go to the toilet? Uh, how do you walk? Lunge is effectively a, a, a walking pattern, just slightly changed. So I have to hopefully try and give and dispel that and try and take that away because the, 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 the thing is that if, if somebody tells somebody that they can't do something because their lower back sore or whatever, their knees are short, whatever, I get it. They are literally kicking the problem into the long grass, take some pain meds and don't run. That'll help. I'm like, no, 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 no. The problem is, is because you're moving incorrectly. Yeah. And your mechanics are slightly off, and they have been off for however long. Um, and it's all fixable. We can make a big change if you just stick to these. It's like 
This book is, I, I wrote, it's like bumper bowling. Throwing it down the lane, you are bound to hit some pins. Yeah. You cannot lose. It is very easy to absorb, hopefully, and the principles are the same so that people, everybody from any kind of um, injury or, or chronic issue that they have, or even if they've been told that they can't do something, they can't bend over and touch their toes because their muscle, their, their back will go into spasm. I had a client, a totally normal client, by the way, I'm not even going to, you know, and she was told that for 10 years, she said, a practitioner of some medical description said, don't touch your toes. You're not allowed to touch your toes. You can't do it. And I, th- I just thought, how, how is that? How is that even? How can you even do that? So I foam rolled the bottom of her feet. This is what I did. I foam rolled the bottom of her feet. I got her to close her eyes. I said, now bend over and touch your toes. And she's like, no, no, but I said, just bend over and touch your toes. And in a spate of about five minutes, she was able to touch her toes for the first time in 10 years. And she was like in tears. She had no idea that just from some foam rolling on the bottom of her feet, some hip mobility exercise, some core activation, some glute engagement, which is all in the book. Yeah. It gives them back this sense of just freedom and life. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I haven't been able yeah. to thought that I, I thought that I couldn't do it. Freedom and life. Isn't that, that says it all really. It gives you know, got intense I, then. Sorry, else. I know, but it's important. And it's I think it's hopefully really empowering and inspiring people to go, well, hold on a minute. Now, of course, some people may have got an issue which actually you know, for good reason, they're not allowed to do I'm something. I'm nodding my it's, head. I'm nodding my head here. Yes. Yeah, and, and 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 we get that. But I I agree with you that many people are told not to do things, and actually, you're just you're just treating a symptom by not doing that thing. Sure, you're not exacerbating that, but you're not exploring. You're not allowing the body to heal and recover. Um, you know, if I think back to my twenties when my back was really bad and. I literally went around to every single therapist who I could think of who might help me. And some of them would give me short-term relief. Quick fix, yeah. Uh, but then- That's in the book too, by the way. You can do but, that. Yeah, but then within a, <laughs> within a week or two, of course. it would come back because I hadn't addressed the underlying movement pattern that meant that my back was taking the strain. Mm. So what's really interesting, I actually have taken up running in quite a big way this year. I say a big way. I, I started off doing the park run with my- son and my daughter on a Sunday morning, which is just 2K when yeah. I do that with them. Love it. And over the last few months, I've started doing the 5K on a Saturday morning, again, with my son and I enjoy it. But I know in my twenties, I could not have done that because my back would have started to play up. Now, why is it that I can now do it? It's because I've done the work mm. at addressing the imbalances, the five minutes sometimes a day. And that's for what it was for me. It was five, sometimes 10 minutes a day. I've had more time on my feet, on my hips getting them moving. And now my biomechanics are so much better that I can run, I can put load on my body mm. and I'm not getting any back pain. And how much older are you now? Yeah, 15, 20 years older, <laughs> exactly. You, you don't know, look it, you don't look it. We don't have to go exact. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a really powerful story there for some of us that, you know, if your knees hurt when you run, sure, maybe you've got osteoarthritis, but maybe it's because- Most likely. Yeah, at but, least try. Yeah, maybe your feet aren't f- firing properly. Maybe your glutes aren't firing properly. Maybe your hips are tight. Yeah. And therefore, when you run, you're putting more load on an already imbalanced system. Yeah. And therefore, your knees hurt. Whereas if you maybe you know do your 21-day reset program and spend a bit of time trying to uh, correct some of those imbalances, um, you know- You'll be able to run. You'll be able to run. And I think- I, I would certainly encourage people to try. It's a bit like a car, isn't it? You know, in some ways, if if your, I don't know, let's say your car has got, or you're on the left side, both tires are a bit flat. Then if you keep driving, if you put a lot of load, a lot of speed or a lot of distance on, you're going to wear out the car a lot faster mm-hmm. than if all four tires were equally pumped up and in balance. It's not, it's probably not a perfect analogy. I, I've got another one. I've yeah, got another one. Are you ready? Okay. I love analogies too. It's a bit like brushing your teeth, okay? If you don't brush your teeth for a couple of days, okay, you know, you can probably get away with it. But if you don't brush your teeth for a year, for two years or three years or four years or 10 years, then they're going to probably fall out of your head. And if you don't look after them, then that's exactly what happens. The body just is like, well, 
if you disrupt this plaque on your teeth by flossing and, and brushing, then guess what? There's not going to be a buildup. But if you really just give it a couple of minutes a day, just keep it, get it in there as a habit, and your body and your teeth will love you forever. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I think it's a really, really nice analogy. Um, as we're coming towards the end of the conversation, David, before we get to the final question, I'm, I'm interested. You, you mentioned that you have got a young family. You've got mm. um, three, how, boys. three boys. How old are they? Six, three, and one. Okay, so very um, in a busy time, let's say. <laughs> you've got a busy job. Don't know what and, you're talking about. <laughs> uh, you've got three young kids. So how do you stay motivated and how do you fit in time in your already busy day to work on your own body? Um, first of all, my reason why I do what I do is not only because obviously I love it, but the reason why I do what I do is because I love being in the climbing frame as soon as I walk through the door. The boys just, you know, run and jump and we play and we have a great time. We have a wrestle and we roll around and just that for me is my reason why currently. When they're older and teenagers, I'm sure that might change. But for now, that's my reason. Um, and if I don't look after myself uh, and make time for myself, whether that's at home and, and, and do some, some basic... Uh, fundamental programs uh, like uh, that I have in my book and or the general workout, doing some Pilates or some yoga or, or, or whatever, the some, some lifting some weights, whatever it is, I know that I cannot be my best self for those kids. It's a bit like putting your, you know, you're putting your, uh, what is it when you're in an aeroplane, put that mask over your face first before yeah. you look after everybody else. You can look after yourself a little bit for uh, as well. And it is it is just a part of my day. It is not as is not a oh I should do. It is just that's just you you've how built it, is. it in. You've this built is how it, it in. Is. Yep. Yeah. Wow. So you've got a powerful why. Um and, and certainly I know for me as a father of kids who are a little bit older than yours, um well, not all of them, but uh, <laughs> eight and six are the ages of my children. And They've been a very powerful motivating factor for me, I must say. Again, my why has changed since I've had kids. It is now very similar to yours. I love being able to do the things that they do. I love watching them move and think, wow, like wow. The, the way the kids can just drop into squats. Yeah. <laughs> I just marvel at it every time. Literally, my son's tired of me telling him. I'm like, wow, that's an incredible squat. <laughs> Isn't it? And it's just perfect. Just perfect, straight <laughs> back, you know, no tightness. Whereas daddy's trying to get into it. I can do it, but I'm, you know, as he knows, I'm currently working on my squats yeah. to improve it and mm -hmm. make it easier um and so i do little things like when we're playing cards or if i'm playing chess with them i'll do it in a squat yeah you know kick your shoes off yeah because then i'm playing with the kids yeah but i'm also working, working on yourself at the same time totally. and it's not like i have to separate that into a different part of my life no and i think for anyone who who can actually do things like that as you said right at the start do the workout while you're watching tv yeah still watch your favorite show if you want just do something for yourself at the same time yep well, David, look, I've really enjoyed the chat. Thank you so much for making some time. I know you are on call for, I think, a film set at the moment. So you've, am, you've come yeah. out. No one has interrupted us, uh, which is brilliant. I wonder, the goal of this is to inspire every single listener to become the architects of their own health. And I always like to leave the listeners with some tips that they can think about applying immediately into their everyday life. I wonder if you have three or four tips that you could share with the listener that might inspire them to get going? Of course. Um, the most important thing that I will always try and promote is correct posture. So we can correct our posture anytime whenever we think about it. So throughout the day, if the phone rings, sit yourself up, chin tuck. And I, how I position the head, the head, the body follows the head in so many ways. But in regards to posture, if you reset your head, Generally, your shoulders will sit back and down and you'll sit a little bit more taller. So if you look down your nose at somebody, imagine you were looking down your nose at somebody anyway, and that little drop of the chin and a little pull back, then your shoulders nice and relaxed and they sit back and down. Um, that will help 
every uh, it will help sort of mitigate against a lot of the rounded chronic issues that we we, we find ourselves so just sit up as as we're talking about this we're is, back to yeah. <laughs> our posture's changed completely significantly. Uh, so we're sitting <laughs> so tuck that chin as you're, as you're listening anyway tuck that chin look down your nose at somebody in front of you or the car in front of you drop your shoulders and just realign that posture um, what's really in the car, I always say use the headrest for a reason when you're sitting down in the car or in your desk. Well, that's a good set. So adjust your chair enough so that you're sitting back enough so that the back of your head is in constant contact with, with the headrest. And it's supported. And it's supported. And then that will force your shoulders to sink back and down because they're not going to be hanging and holding your head up. Yeah. Um, so that's the first one. Uh, second one is breath. And I have spoken about this previously, just very basic, but a nice, easy exercise that everybody can do is a nice box breath. So you've got one hand on your diaphragm, one hand on your chest, and you just for a minute, just for a minute, maybe even two if you have it, start to breathe through your stomach in for five at the top of that breath, hold it for five, breathe out for five, and at the bottom of that exhale, Hold it for five and continue that box breath of five in, five at the top, five seconds out, five at the bottom. Do that for about 20 or so breaths, then you will be in a completely different state. Yeah. Okay. That will center you and you will feel significantly better. I also promote in the book, we haven't discussed really hugely amount, but be mindful of your eating. Um, if you're eating at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, pizzas, burgers, ice cream. Just, I, I promote intermittent fasting of an 18, uh, of a 16-8 of a uh, schedule in my book. So that's eating all food within eight eating hours? Eating all, in inverted commas, food in, within an eight-hour window. Every day or some? Uh, there are five days of intermittent fasting. One day, if this is if you want to go on sort of the weight loss program as well, uh, there's a 500-cal day. There is a 16, 8 intermittent fasting day and there's a day off. Okay. Um, 21 days, no alcohol, no fried food, no, uh, no fried food and, and try and cut out as much sugar as you possibly can. Sure. Um, so do some, so tip three is some sort of- um, Mindful eating. Mindful eating. Shall we say? Yeah. Um, and the final one is conscious movement. When you are working out, if you are at the gym, be very be very aware. Don't just look at the mirror and go, God, that guy is, girl, girl is gorgeous. Look at him. I'm lifting some serious weight. Look at your form. Drop that chin. Pull those shoulders back. Drop the rib cage. Engage that core. Get your glutes firing and be really conscious on what it is you want to achieve that day when you are moving around. Uh, when you are exercising, just be very aware of how you move because 90% of it, if you crack that little code of, oh, I didn't realize I sit like this, yeah. or I, I shift to one side so much more, or whatever it is, center yourself up, align yourself, and then trust me, you will be a lot happier in yourself. Yeah, David, brilliant. Really, really like those tips. And it, it really strikes me that a big theme about everything you're talking about is really about mindfulness, but not necessarily in the sense of, sitting down and meditating, although I'm sure you would be a proponent of that, I would, I would guess. I am, you know. yeah. um, but really being mindful of everything you're doing, mindful about when you eat, mindful about when you're sitting down answering the phone, mindful about when you're in the gym doing your workouts. It's, it's a really common theme. And I think in this age of real distraction where, you know, even if you're in the gym, people are many times trying to take photos of themselves to post about it or catch up with their emails whilst they're in the gym. And again, I get it. It's not about criticizing people. It's about saying, hey, look, maybe it's a time where you can be really mindful and mm. switch off from the outside world and focus on your focus body. Focus on you for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, David, thanks for your time today. Um, where can people connect with you online if they choose to do so? Uh, Instagram at David Higgins London. Um, there is a Facebook community, David Higgins London as well. Um, and yeah, guys, get in touch if you have any questions or, or if you uh, want to discuss anything. Um, and I also have uh, body space gyms in London as well, in Knightsbridge, uh, at Chelsea and at the Corinthia Hotel. 
Fantastic. Amazing. Well, in the show notes page to this uh, episode of the podcast, which will be at drchatterjee.com forward slash Hollywood, uh, <laughs> I will link to all of David's uh, social media handles, to your gyms, anything else, any exciting things online. I'll, I'll link to them all there. And you can also purchase the book from that page. David, hope to have you again on at some point in the future. Thank you very much for having me. That concludes today's episode of the Feel Better, Live More podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and that it has left you feeling inspired about what you need to do to get the most out of the year ahead. You can check out the show notes page for the podcast at drchatterjee.com forward slash Hollywood. Do let David and myself know what you thought of today's episode by tagging us both on social media. In fact, why not take a screenshot on your phone right now and share it with your friends? If you regularly enjoy my weekly podcasts, one of the best ways to support it is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you listen to podcasts on. These reviews help to raise visibility of the podcast, which in turn helps me to attract better guests. On today's show, David and I spoke about a few ideas that I write about in detail in my brand new book, The Stress Solution. I discuss how exercise can be an excellent way of de-stressing, one of the right type and in the right dose. However, many of us are not thinking about the right type and intensity of exercise in the concepts of our wider lifestyles. I explain how you can do this in my book. I also have a whole chapter on the importance of a regular breathing practice to help manage your stress levels and have put together a breathing menu full of many different techniques so that you can choose the ones that appeal to you. The Stress Solution is available to order right now in paperback as well as on audiobook, which I am narrating. All the international book links for my book are available at drchatterjee.com forward slash book. That's it for today. I hope you have a fabulous week. Make sure you have pressed subscribe and I'll be back next week with my latest conversation. Remember, you are the architect of your own health. Making lifestyle changes always worth it because when you feel better, you live more. I'll see you next time.